Recently on the Full Fat Podcast, I said something that sums up how I view canon. Uh-huh. If, if something was made non-canon, but it's not been contradicted yet, then it's canon, canon. to me. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, yeah. When Disney announced that most of the established Star Wars continuity would be resigned to the stuff of Legends, it didn't start to bother me until new material sprung up that actively superseded the original content. In the realm of Star Wars video games, The Force Unleashed is an experience that is close to my heart. <laughs> It was the perfect story of how the Rebellion came to be. I don't feel like Rogue One gets enough of a pasting for completely erasing this from canon. Galen Marek was a far more compelling character than Jyn Erso, and his story exists on a 6th generation console game from 2008. It's 2008. There were a million spin-off stories you could have told, and you went with this one before a Temuera Morrison-led Boba Fett movie. Until this coming winter, the closest thing we've had to a Boba Fett movie was the Jango Fett video game from 2002. Star Wars Bounty Hunter was a tie-in to Attack of the Clones. This video game was a prequel prequel, exploring a seminal tale in the history of Jango Fett and filling in the backstory behind the clone army itself. But the best thing of all, it has yet to be erased from canon. Nothing has yet to contradict it. It shall remain canon. You shall go to the ball, Cinderella. For some reason, Disney is very obsessed with the period between episodes 3 to 4, but less so with anything circling episodes 1 to 2. Thus, Bounty Hunter, which takes place a year after The Phantom Menace, is placed at an advantage. It shall remain canon. Star Wars Bounty Hunter is a pretty dated PS2 experience which you can now get on the PS4, but that doesn't mean there isn't a good deal of fun to be had. This is an authentic Star Wars experience through and through. Everything from the look to the sounds to the story capture that Star Wars magic. But more than that, behind every camera mishap and frustrating and cheap death, there is some fascinating level design and an engrossing blend of early noughties third person shooting and platforming. Before The Mandalorian put the spotlight on the bounty hunter archetype in an ongoing narrative, this game captured the complicated profession in a Jango Fett-led hunt to the death across the stars. Montross, Dooku, Kamari Vosa, Zamwazel, Roz, and Jango Fett star in... Uh, Star Wars Bounty Hunter. I'm going to be looking through every level, the mechanics of the game, what I love, what I hate, and why Jango Fett is surely one of the most important characters in the entire Star Wars mythos, not to mention why Temuera Morrison is going to absolutely crush it as Boba in the upcoming book thereof. If you like my Star Wars videos, of which there are many, and you want to stay updated when they drop, please subscribe with that little notification bell ticked. Thank you for watching, and if you do enjoy it, please like the video, and even leave a comment for the algorithmic gods. But seriously, I try to reply to as many as I can when I get the time, so please let me know what you think of the video. So first off, a little personal history. I first got this game back in 2004 after I got a PS2 in 2003. My mum wouldn't let me get full price games, but I found a copy of this game pre-owned in Game Bexley Heath, and after a little bit of nagging, she reluctantly bought it for me, so long as I promised not to ask for it anymore until my birthday. Come on, Ma. I'm doing a video on it now. You should have had the foresight to see that YouTube.com would become a success, and that your son would one day be making videos on it about crappy old PS2 titles. That game was a long-term investment. I played the shit out of it back in the day, primarily because it was the fourth video game I ever got, after the Hulk 2003 tie-in game, X-Men 2 Wolverine's Revenge, and Disney Extreme Skate Adventure. I was obviously a big Star Wars fan at the time, and Attack of the Clones was still fresh in my tiny mind, so getting to play THE Jango Fett game was just a mind-blowing blast. The other thing I really remember about it was how hard it was. I didn't have a computer at the time, so there was no game FAQs to help me, I just got my ass handed to me, again and again and again. I don't think I ever actually completed it all the way through on my own and ended up using cheat codes to unlock all the levels from a good old physical gaming magazine. Even once you had all the levels unlocked, they were still an absolute bitch to try and complete but that didn't stop me trying. Now I'm struggling to recall exactly when the archives are incomplete, but I'm pretty sure I traded in some of my older PS2 games to buy some PS3 games, probably at that exact same game for an extortionate trade in value as is standard at that chain. I definitely regret that now. I wonder where my original copy is. You could have it in your possession right now. You could be listening to a guy talking about this game and the copy of the game you picked up from game could in fact be the same game as the copy of the game I had in 2003. Unlikely though. 
Flash forward to 2016 and I discovered that the game has been ported to the PlayStation Store at a competitive price. I was studying hard for my university exams that year, but I found the time to boot this up and blast through it. It was a really fun experience at a time when prequel was more of a dirty word in the Disney era than it is now. Coming hot off the back of The Force Awakens, an original trilogy only Battlefront, and an upcoming movie that would directly tie into A New Hope, Disney approved prequel content was few and far between. Even though this wasn't brand new prequel content, it felt like a relic of a bygone age even in 2016 because of the aesthetic and tone that was so closely meant to mirror the prequel era, Attack of the Clones specifically. It was still, to my surprise, very difficult, and I didn't feel so bad about being unable to finish it as a kid, because even as I was becoming a man, this game had the capacity to make me want to throw my control at the wall like I was six years old again. Since I started Full Fat Videos, I've always wanted to cover more video games, but they take a lot more time to write and research because of the nature of the beast. You have to actually sit down and play the sucker and not be bad at it before you even have the footage ready to go in and write the damn thing. Because of that, I've put things like this game on the back burner, but I was always keen to eventually get round to it. Well, lockdown has meant I've been playing way more video games than I have since probably 2015. Now seemed like a better time than ever to dive in and get reacquainted. I wanted to be in the right mood to really drink this one in, and after Tim Ware and Morrison's epic return to the Star Wars world this past winter, what better time than now? I love democracy. I love Django Fett. Now please grant me the emergency powers to say that Django is currently way better than Boba Fett. I'm sorry, I know he was there first and I know a lot of people aren't so hot on Attack of the Clones, but this guy... This guy is my guy. This guy is a bad motherfucker. He takes on Obi-Wan Kenobi, kills a Jedi like it's target practice, and even battles Mace Windu. Mace Windu! <laughs> Well, admittedly, he does fall to the Mace Windu Swingu, but it's better than, I don't know, getting your ass handed to you by blind Han Solo. <laughs> Bobba is cool and all, he's the blueprint, you would have no Django without Bobba, I get it. But Django is just the daddy. Literally. <laughs> Bobber brought some heat in The Mandalorian, and he could easily be better now that his own series is coming, but for now, Django is more compelling to me as a character. But fair's fair, it is due to this game and the way that it paints Django. Don't write me off until you watch me die, face to face. When I say that Django is better, I guess I really mean Tim Wera Morrison is better. Making Bobba a character by placing him under the mask, making full use of the actor's intense presence, is what finally made Bobba a treat for me. And there is a whole lot of Tim Wera Morrison in this game, he lent his voice and likeness to Fett, and it feels like one-to-one -one with the character as seen on the silver screen. So my experience of playing this game and experiencing this Django Fett is something I don't really separate from Attack of the Clones, more one-dimensional bounty hunter. This was the kind of supplementary work surrounding the prequels that added more life and texture to them and was something that I think the sequel trilogy needed during its lifespan to better cultivate a sense of the world. Attack of the Clones got Star Wars Bounty Hunter, the sequels never got a tie-in game or a seminal animated spin-off to tide us over. I'm not sure how to make this promo dynamic. I tell you what, let's get a load of shots of me looking at the laptop, real pensive, and uh, we'll just cut in some VO, it'll look great. Django Fett is a pretty slick bounty hunter, but as we know, it's a complicated profession. If you too have a complicated profession that needs a slick front-facing online presence, then Hover is the place for you to sort yourself out with a fresh domain name. I know when you think of me and full fat videos, you think professional, and that's great, but you can't even tell if I'm wearing pants today. <laughs> and that just goes to show the importance of how your business looks and is perceived online. A slick domain name for your website is the kind of premium sheen that will stop everyone questioning whether or not you even wore pants to the home office. Instead, they'll be impressed with a cool and memorable custom domain name that instills confidence and a commitment to quality. If you have a professional business that needs a dedicated online presence, then you're going to want your website to have a domain name that encapsulates the brand and makes any first impression a good one. Your personal website is a platform that you have complete control over. It represents you, your brand and your business. So why would you not want your domain name to look absolutely spiffing? Spiffing. Hover has over 400 domain name extensions to choose from, including all the classics and fun niche extensions. If I want a slick domain name for my photoshops and digital arts, for example, 
Dot art will look way better and more specific to what my website is all about. Hover allows you to connect your domain name to many website builders with a few simple clicks, so you can easily integrate your new domain name to your pre-existing website. There's no annoying upsells, and you'll be treated to a clean user interface, not to mention access to a best-in-class customer support team. It's quick, easy, and straightforward to get a custom domain name or a custom email address, so why not head on over to Hover to look as slick as humanly possible online. <laughs> Go to hover.com slash full fat to get 10% off your first purchase and start personalizing your brand today. <laughs> right away, this game's story starts straight at the top. None other than Sheev Palpatine has a problem. The Pandogora has become a dangerous parasite. It must be eradicated. Kamari Vosa was tortured by the Bandogora, and the young Jedi, once the Padawan of Count Dooku himself, turned to the dark side and overthrew her abusers. With its leaders dead, Vosa became the new head of the Bandogora. By the time we come to the start of Jango's tale, the Bandogora have managed to infestate the galaxy and threaten the foundations for Darth Sidious's master plan. There's also another interesting problem for Count Dooku. He needs to find a template for the secret clone army. All he tells Sidious is that I shall accomplish both of these tasks with a single stroke, Master. Intriguing. I think you can see where this is going, but it's a fun setup nonetheless. Starting big with the two premier baddies of the then most recent Star Wars movie also meant that the rest of the game wasn't hogtied by cameos and allusions to important characters. This is Django's game. Bounty Hunter divides the story into six chapters. Chapters, eh? Like how the Mandalorian is divided into chapters? Eh? Eh? Okay, that, that is a reach. Each chapter is divided into three distinct levels. These batches of three are always set on the same planet, but vary vastly in design, pace, and mood. You get a lot of variety here, and all of them, every single one, fits seamlessly with the aesthetic of not only the prequels, but the entire scope of Star Wars' visual palette. Game director John Knowles said to GameSpot back in 2002 that the design team looked to Ralph McQuarrie's original concept art, as well as the work of Doug Chang and Joe Johnston visual pioneers of the Star Wars aesthetic right up to the year of this game's release. Across the board, there's a magical blend of locations that feel prequel and OT. None of it is too overbearing, crammed full of references or cameos or iconography. Each level feels like a fully realised piece of the war's world. Well, Rendered by PS2 graphics, that is, which range in quality. Man-made structures fare much better than the rocky terrain and caves you encounter later on. But for the context of the time, I think this game looks pretty good, and its art direction charms me through its most dated patches. Chapter 1 takes place at Roz's battle station in the middle of the hunt for Miko. You don't know much about this lowlife other than that he's got British teeth. These levels are the simplest in the game, but really function to train you in the mechanics. There's a little bit of everything in the pit area chapter. Some platforming, some vents, some laser cutting, actually really fun to do, and of course, some shooting. There's never much reason to use your fists since your blasters have unlimited ammo, but early on it's fun to hit a couple of Gamorrean guards without being overrun. It's a pretty good front kick, Django. You feel powerful smacking dudes, which means that LucasArts perfectly translated the carnage we would be treated to from Tamira Morrison in 20 years' time. It's a shame you don't get more melee weapons in this game. It's square to attack even with your guns. This old third-person shooter style would have worked perfectly with, like, staffs and spears and what have you, although I'm glad it doesn't flirt with the idea of giving him a lightsaber. The second level takes you to Merchant's Row, where you have to follow an NPC, which is weird, but then you get the jetpack, which is good! This guy actually tries to sell your own jetpack back to you. What a douchebag. I'll take that off your hands. Uh, how much you offering? your life. It's great that you just have the jetpack early on and it immediately changes the game. Suddenly Star Wars Bounty Hunter complements its shooting with a whole host of platforming challenges. It's got precarious bottomless pits, a Star Wars mainstay, and a surprising amount of verticality, but more on that when we get to Coruscant. The jetpack is useful in so many scenarios and encounters, both for platforming and combat, that it becomes the most essential tool in the game. You never upgrade the fuel, so you're quickly forced to learn all the tricks that you have, but it's not really frustrating. Your fuel recharges as quickly as you burn it, it becomes more about strategically using the jetpack from place to place, rather than wishing you had longer flight time. Nice jetpack! Nice jetpack! 
You use the jetpack every couple of seconds, seriously. The jetpack is pretty well realised, I like it. Also, this is 2002, you can't expect LucasArts to create levels of this detail and let you hover over the entire map. The limitations of the jetpack make it fun, but never make you feel like you're merely cosplaying FET. LucasArts originally developed specific user areas for the jetpack and development, but thankfully saw the light, because that would have sucked major, major balls. The level sans jetpack are fine, but pale in comparison to even the earliest flying locations. Take this sewer segment at the end of the second level, where you... Ew, climb in and descend by sliding down the streams and jetpacking through to the next section. The docking bay's level is big and expansive and full of travelators that get annoying but it's kind of cool to see them all going at once. Look at it. Madness. Miko is a rather large, bald alien, so rather than have a duel, he climbs into a big ship and you have to shoot the big ship until he gets back out of the big ship and then, well, you've got egg on your face, mate, because now you're f***ed. It's here where we cut across the galaxy to Montross. Montross. Now, if you thought Kamari Vosa sounded cool, this guy is a quipping dark mirror to Jango Fett, a Mandalorian bounty hunter driven only by the bloodlust of the hunt and voiced by none other than Clancy Brown. There's some great one-liners from Montross throughout the game delivered by Brown's instantly recognizable tones. He doesn't have much more to say. He just froze up on me. I'm worth more alive! You're worth enough dead. If you've played Star Wars Bounty Hunter, you can imagine the kick out of seeing Clancy Brown take on the Mandalorian himself in the series as Dirk. Not to mention his Clone Wars connection as Savage Press. Montross. It's been a long time, Django. Not long enough. Montross is a really fun addition to the game and pops up several times. He hates Django and you feel a touch of their history together every time they come into contact. You didn't deserve the privilege of command. After I left, you're the one who led the Mandalorians to their deaths. Both Mandalorians have been invited to an exclusive contract to kill Kamari Vosa by a man called Tyrannus. Hmm. I wonder who that is. Right away in this early cutscene between Django and his friend Ross, it is apparent that there's a surprising amount of energy in the writing. Django and Ross are likeable and feel like authentic friends. There's none of the clunkiness or wooden dialogue synonymous with Attack of the Clones, and there's some cool lines that paint Django as the beast he should be. I wouldn't be surprised if you ran into Montross on this hunt. I'd be surprised if I didn't. Also gotta love how Vosa's Jedi hologram turns into a dark side image just as Roz says she has a bad feeling about this. Ooh. Roz adds some much needed softness to the hard-edged bounty hunter who spends most of his time behind a mask. She's helpful but also critical, quick to point out that Django is a man wrapped up in the past, driving around a pretty crappy old relic just because it once belonged to his mentor. You ever think maybe you hang onto that chip? Those memories! Because you're looking for someone to take under your own wing! The writing is well structured and does a good job of seeding in the payoff of Django becoming the clone template, making it an emotional hook that's more about the warrior's refusal to look beyond his work and find something more fulfilling in his life. You won't live forever, you know. Not in this business. Not in this lifetime, Ross. Of course, in Star Wars, how else could this manifest other than in parenthood or in immortality? What with all the origins being told in the space of one adventure, I get solo a Star Wars story vibes. You know how in that movie he gets his gun, his ship, his best friend in like a day? It's kind of hokey, but I find it quite charming to be honest. It's satisfying seeing Django get his ship, meet Zamozel, and complete the hunt that made him and gave way to the creation of the legendary Boba Fett, all in the space of one epic Star Wars adventure. With the hunt underway, it's off to Coruscant. Before I go any further, I should probably talk about the most talked about woe of Bounty Hunter. Look, I'm a big boy now and I can admit when nostalgia undoubtedly plays a factor into my enjoyment, I'm also willing to admit the shortcomings of the game and the things that straight up do not hold up. The biggest offender is surely the camera. This game came out before the Gears and Uncharted's of the world dominated the third person actioner and helped to make right stick aiming the norm. Instead, this game falls prey to the notorious third person shooter pitfalls of the noughties. Locking on and just spamming your guns for dear life instead of having any kind of dedicated workable aiming system. Sure, you can aim manually by holding R2, but you can't move Django Wash during this mode, and the movement and sensitivity defaults make it awkward to perform. This aiming system is only worthwhile when you have the opportunity to get the jump on an enemy from a distance. 
close range, it's like you're playing Resident Evil 4 whilst all the enemies are playing, I don't know, Vanquish. Now in terms of the actual lock on camera, I don't think that's too bad. When you snap onto an enemy, there's no screwing around. You remain fixed on them no matter how much you flip, roll and jetpack around. Thankfully, the gameplay has a focus on agility and speed in the firefights over the more modern pop and cover systems. So I largely found the firefights to be fairly easy to control so long as you play the way the game wants you to. The worst points of the camera are, in any case, when you aren't fighting enemies but trying to navigate. Sometimes well thought out and designed platforming sections are hampered by the camera trying to force itself into a position that makes the traversal harder than it needs to be. Moving the camera with the right stick is jerky and hard to wrangle. If you're in a tight space like an elevator, well, good luck with that and go fuck yourself. When the level design isn't particularly clear, the camera can become nauseating and disorientating. I would sometimes find myself forced to stop and get the camera in order before I could make any of my next moves. At the same time, I do think the camera's issues can be blown out of proportion. It's irritating, yeah, but when you're in the midst of a firefight, a string of firefights, and you're locking on to one enemy after the next, it doesn't matter all that much. And yeah, it's a bad camera, but for the time it was made, you were unlikely to get much better. Games like this fumbled their camera systems, and the Gears of Uncharted of the world learnt from them. The Coruscant levels are some of my favourite designed levels in the game. Each one perfectly captures a different feeling and vibe from the places in Coruscant you go to in Attack of the Clones. You get the eerie industrial district from the scene where Count Dooku reunites with old Palpy at the end of the movie, you get to go to the fancy upper city, a bit Bespin-esque, and on that note you even get a shootout of Montrose in a Carbonite chamber. Corazon is my favourite Star Wars planet, and it's just a joy to see these levels recreate its many different tones through the power of a now far obsolete system. These are easily the levels I like to replay the most, and it's all because of how much I enjoy walking through them. You start off in the glitzy and flash entertainment district, a visual recreation of the location as seen in the Anakin Obi speeder chase. This is a weird level, there's not a lot of challenge, and the objective is kind of weird. You're on the hunt for a bounty, but it's essentially just a poorly designed tailing mission as you follow your targets without killing them, a task made irritating by all the gunfire zipping across the environment. This is a minor quibble across the entire experience, but you can easily accidentally tag folks that you don't want to, including all the innocent animals that populate the level. No, no, I don't want to hit Mr. Lizard. Come on, get out of the way, get out of the way. That's it. Die, Jedi, die! What did I say? The Entertainment District is visually impressive enough with a populated world full of NPCs, that it's hard to hate this level. There's a fun little bar shootout, and Django has a cool exchange with the bartender. Listen, friend. I'm giving you a chance to save your club. But other than that, this level is style over substance. It's over just as you start to tire of following people around, and we're whisked away to a less colourful part of Coruscant for a much better level. You idiot. You don't have to get mean, I'm new. They don't tell me much. After murdering this poor sap on his first day, you navigate through the industrial district until you come to this seriously cool bit of platforming. I love the draw distance here, and the fact that you have to continuously jetpack downwards. It's a real big drop, and it's just satisfying to pull it off. Plus, Django does the Mando super landing if you hit the ground without breaking your fall. Even though a Django Boba Fett game would be an awesome open world experience, Bounty Hunter doesn't really need it. The large open areas such as this one make you feel like you get to flex the jetpack's chops, but it is also narrow enough to keep the action focused. This level then switches gears to the aforementioned Cloud City Carbonite Chamber look, and it's again very well realised. It's a novelty to fight Montross in the freezing chamber, but there's no way it won't put a smile on your face. The real problem is just that it's hilariously easy. I had to try and amuse myself with the flamethrower to give Montross any kind of challenge, and even then it was still just like, piss easy. Seriously. The final level of the Coruscant Trinity takes you to a far more rich and sophisticated side of the planet, only to reveal that it is every bit the wretched hive of scum and villainy as the other districts. You're on the hunt for Senator Trell, a corrupt aide to the Bandogora, and your next lead on the hunt. The Coruscant cops are effectively his own private army, so you have to scale higher and higher, dealing with waves of police to make it to the top. This is hands down my favourite level. Not only is it gorgeous to look at, it is so satisfying to see Django get further and further away from his ship, the starting point of the level. This always blew my mind as a kid, and it's still impressive today. By the time you make it up to the top, you really feel like you've achieved something, and the singular direction makes it less disorientating and confusing than some of the later levels. The best way to feel how far you've come is to mercilessly fling yourself off the side like a true Mandalorian. At 
the end, Django once again shows how awesome he can be with good writing, as he gives Trail a proper Spartan send-off. Do what, do what he says, bounty hunter. Release, Release him. him! Now! As you wish. Very poor choice of words. <laughs> The only thing that lets this level down is the boss. I'm pretty sure I should be able to hit whatever I'm supposed to hit on this boss without resorting to using the grenades from like a high angle. It's kind of broken. Django gets a hefty set of weapons throughout the game. Whenever I start a new level, I do a quick pass through the weapon select because much like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're gonna get. You can't pick a loadout or anything like that. It's just like dinner at your mum's, you'll get what you're given. The blasters are the meat and potatoes of the weapon inventory. Well. To be honest, they're the meat, the potatoes, the peas, the pigs in blankets, the gravy, and the carrots. The rest of the weapons come under other on your plate. They don't even get a designation because they're so utterly unimportant compared to these babies. I'm only mostly exaggerating. Some of the weapons are quite fun to use and make a tremendous ruckus. The classic FET backpack rocket is liberally applied throughout the whole game, and it never gets old firing off one against a single lone enemy and watching them have the worst day at the office imaginable. But what the rockets and all the other weapons have in common with each other, you can't use them very easily. It would be a misnomer to suggest that the dual blasters are the only useful weapons in the game. The poison darts can be a convenient insta-kill on larger foes. The flamethrower is perfect for dealing with hordes. The missiles, I literally just covered, but fuck it, we're gonna mention them again. They have all served me well in certain combat situations, but actually selecting them and using them in the middle of a gunfight is easier said than done. The game would have really benefited from a weapon wheel that paused the action, giving you a moment to think and select exactly what you want, rather than frantically hitting left and right on the d-pad as you cycle through a bunch of icons in the bottom right corner as enemies and wild animals try and shoot at you and eat your face off. Maybe a live d-pad weapon select would be fine in a slower paced game, but you're often jumping and flipping about the place and there's never really an opportune moment to switch unless you fall back. Even if you manage to select your weapon efficiently, you have such a finite amount of ammo for all of them that you'll be switching back to the dual blasters in no time, which by the way, have unlimited ammo, if that hasn't gone in yet. Not to mention, they fire as fast as you can press square. This is actually something that I really enjoy about these guns, because in the most frantic action moments, you're hammering square so quickly that it feels like you're really unloading clip after clip on these fools. I feel like I'm in an action movie firing everything I've got, man. <laughs> They are far and away the most effective weapons in all situations, even bosses, and the blasters ensure you're never caught short when an enemy pops out of nowhere to kill you in the most frustrating manner possible. The lock-on mode is also clearly geared towards these guns specifically, because you still flip around and you can be agile with them. The poison darts and flamethrowers don't work nearly as well with this mechanic, and you're better off eyeballing it. The sniper rifle is a little different, but frustrating in its own way. It exists as a bit of an anomaly amongst the rest of your inventory. This gun has a fair few tailored sections, particularly in the Malastare levels, where it pays to think ahead, perch on a position, and pick your foes off from a distance. The aiming is shoddy though. There were a few instances where I had a clear line of sight on a target, but the actual blast was being clipped by where I was standing, making it impossible to hit them. Other times, I actually got a clean shot and it just wouldn't register. However, when it works well, it is incredibly satisfying to preemptively clean out a room, especially if you need to perform some complex platforming and you don't want to get shot at. There's some heavy weapons which you can pick up randomly and use until they run out of ammo. They effectively work as a power-up on your standard blasters, but doing it this way feels way cooler than just getting like a temporary damage boost or something. Sometimes I just like to walk around and see how boss Django looks holding them. The only weapons, the only weapons I think are completely freaking useless are the grenades. I still don't know after 20 years exactly how you're supposed to throw them without endangering yourself. They're not very fun to use and honestly, there's such a risk of instant death because of their explosive power that I can never be asked to experiment with them for the sake of losing a continue. Screw it, you don't need them if you want to blow things up use the rockets. Outside of their relative usefulness, the thing the weaponry has going massively in its favour is... Whether it was Django or Bobba that made you get hyper seeing the whipcord or the flamethrower or the rockets in action, it's safe to say that the Fets have probably the coolest weapons in the galaxy outside of the Force users and probably Daddy Mando. So it would have been nothing less than disappointing if you couldn't wield all of them and they didn't feel mighty powerful. As you run through the level, dispatching waves of bad guys of all of this gear, you feel like you're a cut above your enemies. You feel like how Django and Bobba feel in the Star Wars universe. Pound for pound, some of the best warriors in the Star Wars galaxy 
certainly some of the best non-force sensitives. So now you need to go to Malastare to find Sabolto. No, 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 wait. You need an excuse not to get shot on sight, so you're going to bring Sabolto a bounty as a gift. Bring Sabolto a gift, not a bad idea. You need to go get Bendix Fust. Great name. Out of prison on Uvo 4, Django gets in by slipping the force field and banking on the incompetence of the guards. Probably another glitch, like that false biosignature we saw in the cargo hold earlier. There's a change in the silicon mass. That's yeah, probably a bird. It'll fly away when we fire it up. When will the staff just check these things, man? The Uvo 4 missions are probably, all things considered, the blandest missions in the game. Neither really fun nor hair-splittingly hard to warrant being memorable. But I do like that you go from shooting corrupt Coruscant cops to duplicitous politicians to taking on the might of a Republic prison. Consistently in the game, you're shooting at the henchmen of corrupt power structures just as much as gangsters. Even though we're in the days of the Republic, it doesn't mean things are good for everyone in the galaxy. For a man just trying to make his way in the universe, the Republic and the criminal underworld are two sides of the same coin. You just need to outgun everybody else. These three missions titled The Break-In, The Breakout, and The Escape Hmm, isn't that just more of the breakout? Aren't really riffing on any iconic Star Wars locations, and it's basically just a load of drab prison interiors in space. There's a prison riot, but all that really manifests from that is a string of baddies who run at you with melee weapons whilst you heroically shoot at them from a safe distance. Escape from Butcher Bay, this is not. Two notable things happen in this chapter, however. First of all, it turns out that a rival bounty hunter, who turns out to be Zamwazel, also wants Bendix Fust. The both of you end up teaming up to whisk B Fust out of there. The second thing occurs during the final mission, the escape. After your original ship is destroyed, Django is forced to steal a Pursuit Special, one of only a handful of prototype ships on the prison planet. But just before you can claim the infamous Slave One, you have to fight a giant ass robot. It's here where if you haven't realized already, you will start to become aware that the boss battles The boss battles are ridiculously easy. I don't think I died on a single boss battle in my recorded playthrough. No, tell a lie, I died once fighting Longo 2 guns, but that was only because I went into the boss fight with basically no health, and instead of a proper boss fight, you're fighting a room full of enemies. The thing that is usually quite difficult in the main game anyway. The dissonance between the difficulty of the levels and the difficulty of the bosses only grows and gets more bizarre as the game goes on. Even the hardest, most irritating levels full of difficult waves of bad guys feature boss fights that consist of spamming the dual blasters for upwards of a minute at a single target before loading up a cutscene. It's better than having no boss fights, but something a bit more thought out and tailored to each boss would have been nice. Having said that, after facing some of the regular enemies, you'll be thankful for an easy boss fight when all is said and done. Your enemies lose health really quickly, and they're not particularly smart, so much of the challenge comes from their relentless aggression and being overwhelmed by sheer numbers. Either that, or you end up jumping around trying to avoid them, and you die from falling. If those things don't get you, look out for the two most annoying enemy types in the game, snipers and rocketers. Rocketeers? <laughs> Sniper enemies will always get a perfect shot on you before you even know that they're there. They are relentless and can easily drain you of all of your health in seconds. If you're not careful, you'll die loads of times to sniper fire across the campaign. They're so much faster than you using your own sniper rifle, so half the time all you can do is hope to strafe and dodge fast enough to get on top of them and blast them away. Even if you end up rolling like your life depends on it, you'll more than likely take a hit or two. The snipers instantly take the difficulty of the game up a notch. But boy, oh boy, nothing prepares you for the rockets. They will always, always come after you when you desperately need to get across a precarious drop and you have like two continues left. They're powerful and they freaking follow you to dodge these fuckers, you have to time it perfectly. If you're in an awkward spot, you can't lock onto them, it becomes absolutely ridiculous to try and kill them because you need to somehow manually aim and destroy them before they can fire off another rocket. <laughs> Just like the snipers, they're insanely efficient and they can aim way better than a stormtrooper ever could. Sometimes it feels like rocket after rocket after rocket, and sometimes it really is. Even 
although they're the most frustrating enemies to encounter, they're way more satisfying to defeat than the snipers. It always makes you feel like Iron Man when you narrowly swerve a missile zipping past your helmet. The most unique enemies come in the form of, essentially, Star Wars zombies. The Bandogora are the kind of zombies that run too, because god damn it, Star Wars Bounty Hunter does not want to hold your hand for one bloody second. They're a fun change to an otherwise pretty standard variety of enemies. Bounty Hunter is cheeky though, and it manages to get away with very little enemy variation because of the amount of variation in their designs. You'll be facing dorky looking Coruscant cops with their cumbersome helmets, and then you'll be shooting at gangsters, a mishmash of a whole host of different races in the Star Wars universe. You fight Tusken Raiders, Gamorrean Gods, and members of Sebulba's race. The, uh... Doug. How's your classes going, Doug? As I was saying, you fight Tusken Raiders, Gamorrean Gods, and the Dougie Doug Doug, and when you see them, you're like, oh, cool, and that often distracts you from the fact that they are no different to the other melee, blaster, and sniper characters. With Bendix Fust, Bendix Fust, captured, Django and Zam go to Malastare. Django and Zam have a fun dynamic, but it's kind of weird in the context of the movie this game ties into. It was a bounty hunter who called. <laughs> Pretty cold-blooded end, and this game is trying to make me buy these two as a dynamic duo. Roz keeps pushing for Django to ask her out, and that ultimately goes nowhere, but then... That makes sense, because... Zam goes ahead first with the Fustmeister, and Django lands in the jungle to tag along behind. These jungle fet sections emphasise long-range shooting, but it lays bare the shortcomings of the mechanics. Snipers will shoot at you so quickly, and do so much damage that it's not impossible to peer out and line up a sniper shot. You can only really use it if you notice them before they notice you, or if you manage to get into a position where the AI can't quite get you, but it's impossible to not take a couple of cheap shots in these levels. Thankfully, the design of the jungle is cool, and you get to fight those gigantic cats that pop up in Attack of the Clones. Nexu, and they're just as much trouble for Django as they were for Padme. <laughs> Their huge lunge attacks really keep you on your toes and make full use of your jetpack. This level ends with an annoying mandatory sniper section where you have to cover Zam, who, of course, walks out in the open and doesn't bother to fire back at her attackers. The next level sees you infiltrate Sabalto's compound. Django and Zam's partnership continues as you obliterate the Doug in their Dougie Doug holes before eventually pulling off this sweet slide. As you progress this level, the game starts to throw loads of bad guys at you and you get a big taste of how annoying the rockets can be. Django is also a bit of a dick to Zam for no reason, and I don't really get what the problem is here. You'll do as you're told. That's what you'd like. Why dispose of the extra hand in combat? Guess you're just being grumpy, Django. It's not like we're not being swarmed with enemies and rockets. I had a really close call on this playthrough after getting all of my continues wasted, just getting absolutely creamed by the rockets in this platforming section. <laughs> I eventually just ran to the end and got some health by the skin of my teeth. It was then onto kicking Sabalto's ass for, you guessed it, another ridiculously easy boss fight. I love the way the following level begins. Sabalto, the final boss of the last level, just mistimes his jump in a cutscene and dies. That's hilarious. Star Wars should be goofy sometimes, and that is the perfect note. That'll be a sour batch. The Death Stick Factory gives you these cool downwards jetpack puzzles as you move through different gaps. It's really satisfying to continuously move down without touching the flooring, although it can be confusing to navigate on first try. It's a really expansive level that throws a ton of different jumping puzzles at you, and there's so much potential for full death, it's insane. This is where the game really starts to try and kick you in the balls, just wave after wave of tough segments without a checkpoint in sight, and this level features one of the toughest, most irritating sections in the game. You're getting shot at by snipers from different sides as you precariously hop on these tiny ledges that you can't latch onto, by the way, so if you miss it, that's it. You can do everything right in this level up until this bit, 
and you can then waste all of your continues on a stupid pile of rocks. Not the boss in the same level, no, that's really easy, but this rock, this fucking rock... YOU'RE AN INANIMATE FUCKING OBJECT! The Bandogora are impossible to hit, even at angles where you can clearly see them. Not even a well-placed rocket will do them in, you have to hit these cave dwellers dead on. I guarantee this section will have you tearing your hair out. There's a cool weird pipe jumping bit which requires you to take everyone out of the sniper rifle first, that's fun, and then the mission is topped off by another ridiculously easy boss battle with Montross. It's like shooting fish in a barrel with this guy, but since the rest of the level is so bloody tough, you just don't mind. You just don't mind at this point. An easy boss. Yes, sure, please, on to the next level. We were betrayed. To the Jedi. So I heard. Too bad I wasn't there to see it. The bounty system is so broken. The way it works is you select your scanner and hover over an enemy or NPC, and should a price be on their head, dead or alive, you can mark them for capture. From there you can either choose to tie them up with your whipcord and press triangle to make them disappear, or you might end up shooting them, but I don't know why you would choose to do this since they're always worth more alive. If you've never played this game, you might be watching this thinking, that sounds cool, and it is, and it's nice that LucasArts thought to include some sort of in-game bounty mechanic to make you feel like you're more than a mindless death machine slash jetpacking Mario. But this mechanic doesn't work for a few reasons. Some bounties will give themselves a way through cowardice, they might run around like headless chickens or even drop their guns and cower in your presence. But in a big area of lots of people shooting at you, it becomes nigh impossible to tell if anyone is carrying a price on their head. This means that if you want to scan everyone, you need to enter a room just enough to get a line of sight on everybody without disturbing them enough to make them shoot and follow you around. You can only aim with the scanner, there's no lock on mechanic, you can't cycle through anyone, you have to awkwardly aim in first person to get a match every single time. You'll be trying to do this while someone is shooting at you, you'll lose about mm, half your health and then you'll promptly decide to pack it in and come out blasting instead. So you're thinking, Okay, okay, it's clunky and not the best decision to make before a firefight, but catching bounties rewards you with credits. Credits are good, right? And the total keeps going up. What do you use credits for? A clunky system can still be worth using if the yield is big. I spent an entire weekend sending out probes on Mass Effect 2. I can catch a couple of bounties, right? So what do you get? You get concept art, trading cards, a comic book. I know, right? Complete f Cool. Well, to be fair, other things like completing the levels do get you some of this bonus stuff, and some of this bonus stuff is actually pretty cool, like the first part of the tie-in comic and these cutesy faux outtakes, but you get my point. But who's the bounty? Yeah, does it matter? Oh, well, I guess not. You get nothing that adds to the gameplay in any way, shape, or form. I've seen a lot of people suggest upgrades, and that would have been sweet. Maybe there could have been some hard-to-reach Zelda-esque places in earlier levels that you could have gone back to with some weapon upgrades. Upgrades for your jetpack are the obvious one, even if, as I said earlier, I kind of like that you have to learn to use it how it is. You could have upgraded your health at the very least, but let's say for argument's sake, this game is charming enough without upgrades, and the run-and-gun nature of it begets a simpler loadout. Okay, at least use credits to buy myself some replayability. What if credits got me different outfits, modifiers to the gameplay to provide a new challenge? What about like, you know, a one-hit kill mode, or stronger enemies, or fun things like goofy glasses and filters you could get in LEGO Star Wars? I'm sure there's a whole host of ways the credit system could have been used to inject some replayability into the mix. Hell, this is a few years before the horde mode trend, but I could have happily used the credit system to filter in some kind of bogus gameplay like some challenge rooms. I'd love to see how long you could last against an onslaught of these bad guys flipping infinitely around a room. Much like the big man himself, if there's no reward for capturing these guys, then there's little incentive to do it. Whenever I play through the game, I switch to the scanner out of morbid curiosity. Ooh, they look like a bounty. I bet they're a bounty. They are a bounty, but it's hollow fun I'm making from a poor system. If you never once switch to the scanner after the initial tutorial, you'll not miss out on anything Star Wars Bounty Hunter has to offer. Zam saves Django from Montross, and she cottons onto the whole Kamari Vosa hunt. Django and Zam then work out the next place to go is Tatooine because of some markings on the death sticks and such and such. You don't know which hut is connected to Vosa, so the pair split up and Fett goes after a bounty for the breathy space slug. I'll await your transmission. And so will I, Fett. Mando ends up on the edge of hut territory tracking local gangster Longo Two Guns. Hmm, Longo Two Guns. 
Django two guns. Here we're introduced to another Mando trope, taking your incredibly useful jetpack off when heading into dangerous situations. Seriously, why does Mando do that? Why does Fett do it? Boba never takes it off, he just hurls himself into sail barges before wrestling Sarlacc pits. <laughs> Because you have no jetpack for some reason, the level is built all around this limitation. You don't have all your moves, and the platforming that carries a lot of the bigger levels is restricted, so it compensates by throwing ridiculous amounts of bad guys at you. Admittedly, this is more fun than it should be, the environments have a nice level of verticality, and the path is fairly straightforward. Plus this mission feels like a loving recreation of Mos Eisley, right down to an NPC Ronto as seen in the special editions. At the end of the level, Django gives Longo no lives to Jabba the Hutt, and earns an audience with him. It's cool to look at this scene in retrospective, knowing that his boy Bobba would take the throne. Proud dad moment. Next you're off to the Tuscan Canyons. This mission is an absolute bitch. Not only is it full of pesky enemies strategically placed to shoot you in the back of your fucking head when you turn the corner, but it's easily the most confusing level in the game to navigate. Since you're in the canyons and getting a visual overload of yellow and brown, it can be difficult to attain which way is forward, and this problem is only exacerbated when you end up in the tunnels. Turns out you need to stand on these bones and fly upwards in a tiny cave. Who knew? If you take a slightly wrong route towards the end of the level, you can end up back at the sail barge and you have to take the scenic route all the way back. At the same time, the constant threat of insta-death from all the bottomless pits dotted around really ups the tension, particularly when you have to hop from barge to barge and narrowly avoid the Sarlacc pit at the bottom. I'm ashamed to say that even though I've probably played this level several times over the last 20 years, I managed to fall in. <laughs> And on that note, the way you fall into the sail barge section is unexpected and pretty awesome. You just power slide right into the mess, baby. You then get captured and go to Gardula's palace. So you start this level with no jetpack again, but this time it feels organic to the story. Gardula the Hutt has stripped you of your weapons and has fed you to a crate dragon. You have to work out how to get out of this massive arena, and it leads to the single most satisfying bit of laser cutting in the entire game. Love those laser cuts. You get your armor back and circle your way back to Gardula, tanking her entire private army like your bloody Django wick. Then it's time for the crate dragon. When Din Djarin fought one of these beasties, it was a fantastic opening set piece that made great use of the wider aspect ratio and established the crate as an incredibly difficult kill. <laughs> Well, that was easy. This level is usually the hardest boss fight in the game because of all those pesky rocket launchers, but the dragon's relative size and speed make it easy to trap in one spot as you relentlessly pummel it with lasers. I feel bad berating the lack of good bosses earlier when this one is actually fairly difficult, but then again, it does the Longo two guns trick, overwhelming you with difficult enemies to make up for the fact that the boss itself is weak. But anyhow, you send Roz the data from Godzilla's vault, and it's now just a matter of time before you have the coordinates to the Bandogora headquarters. Oh, and you leave Zam because she betrays you or something. I've gone far enough into this video without covering something very important which adds to the entire experience, but I can't really show you that aspect of it and do it justice. It's the sound effects and the music. The sound effects are ripped right out of the movies, even complete with a Wilhelm scream here and there. When I say it's fun to fire Django's guns and fly around in his jetpack, the faithfully recreated sound effects have a lot to do with that. Jeremy Soul created a score that fits in seamlessly with the John Williams tracks that play throughout the action, including Django's escape. If you want to hear all the awesome original tracks for this game, then there's a great YouTube video that's put them up complete with chapters, so I'll link that in the description for you. My favourites are definitely the main theme and Montross's motif. 
awesome work that stands up to the iconic might of William's cinematic work in one gaming experience. I also don't want to exhaust this with a conversation about ludonarrative dissonance, but since I touched on it a little in my Luke Skywalker Battlefront 2 video, I want to touch on it here. I don't care that much about it in original video games, but adaptations work best when some credence is paid to making your characters act like the personalities they are known for. Luke helping an Imperial soldier see a different path, and Django running around the Republic causing chaos and getting paid for it, fits seamlessly. Couple this with those awesome on-point sound effects and the Chang Macquarie visual sandwich and you've really got yourself a stew going. This home threw it in a pot, add some broth, a potato, baby you got a stew going. Before Django and Montross can get to the moon of Bogdan and attempt to snatch the head of Kamari Vosa, the pair have some squabbles to attend to. Montross pays a visit to Roz to attain the crucial coordinates. She's a tough old bird. Took a while to get her to hand over that data. You've just signed your death warrant. Django gets to Roz, but it's too late. With her dying breath, she imparts her last words of wisdom. Just find something, something to live for besides the money. You deserve more. For a character that only exists in cutscenes chapter to chapter, I think they did a pretty good job at making you give a shit when Roz croaks. The way she spurs Django on to finding some sense of fulfillment in his life gives me Yinsen vibes. <sighs> Don't waste your life. I do wonder what happened here in terms of the production values though. This scene plays in between chapters isolated from the actual levels. Was this meant to be part of a scene with a return mission to the battle station? Ross tells you that Montross has placed bombs on the station and you need to get out fast. Maybe there was some kind of timed escape objective that would have followed rather than just reverting back to a CGI cutscene. Maybe they just ran out of juice with the glossy CGI ILM cutscenes and we had to resort to this? Either way, it's a little bit of a shame. The Bogdan moon has that Dathomir quality in Jedi Fallen Order. Everything is either dead and rotting, or worse, alive and rotting. It feels dank and cold and dangerous, and the lack of NPCs and droids and creatures makes it feel empty and lifeless in a good way. It is appropriately eerie for the headquarters of a Star Wars cult. If you don't use the flamethrower on the Bando Gora, you're going to be finding the risks of developing carpal tunnel reaching a fever pitch as you frantically hammer square to fire. My favourite section from all three of the Dead Moon levels occurred in the very first one. You climb onto the roofs of these structures and hop along until you make it to the next section. There's a lot of well-placed enemies and space to manoeuvre, making it feel appropriately treacherous and eerie. Montross decides to give you the chance to avenge your fallen mentor, Jastamar Eel, in a Mandalorian battle to the death. He's even going to wear the armour! This is of course stupidly easy, but Montross gets a dope monologue at the start, so I don't really mind. The money means nothing. The thrill of the hunt drives me, the moment my prey begs for mercy. And he gets a metal as hell death scene, as Django not only leaves him wanting for a warrior's death, but deserts him to be torn apart by the Bando Gora. Oh! Django! Come back! Django takes no prisoners. Well, unless he's getting paid. He's a bounty hunter. You end up captured by Vosa, and there's this weird, needlessly sexy scene where Vosa straddles Fett and says things like, oh, The strong silent type. I like that. More of a challenge. Thankfully, Zam turns up and gets this over with, so we can go back to the sexless, sexless joy of infiltrating an intergalactic drug cartel. Uh -huh. Kamari Vosa is fun to battle, but ultimately no more difficult than the other bosses, which is to say, very easy. It's both weird in the gameplay and the narrative for this fight to be as easy as it is. We know that Django has an unsavoury opinion of the Jedi, and that their powers and abilities are no joke. You'd expect the game to make a bit more of a big deal of the fact that you, Django, an ordinary man, are going to be fighting a super-powered warrior witch on her home turf. This is a bit of a suicide mission, and no one, not even level-headed Roz, questions this. The blast helmet of a Mandalore warrior. I must have cut down 20 of your kind myself. The dangers of the hunt are rooted in the scope and scale of the burgeoning Bandogora cult, not the seemingly impossible task of killing a dark side force user. Django only references the Jedi once in a cutscene, and the game downplays the David vs Goliath aspect to our hero facing this villain. It's not really a criticism of the game so much as it is a missed opportunity. It's nice that Lucasfilm created a spin-off comic detailing Django's Jedi entanglements, but it seems like those flashbacks had a place in the game itself. 
You could have easily had a chapter of missions set in the past with young Django and Montrose as they appear in the comic, and it could easily fold back into the larger narrative and answer questions as to why both men hold the opinions and outlooks that they do. I also think part of the problem with this final boss is that you've spent the entire game fighting long range shooting characters with the occasional slow moving brutes thrown in. You haven't really been trained against lightsabers that are known for parrying blaster fire. Surely there's a satisfying mechanic that could have worked here. Maybe you could have fought enemies with Magna Guard type staffs that can block a lightsaber and parry firepower as a lead up to the big cheese Vosa. Vosa blocks all of your attacks, as you would expect, and then does this weird Dragon Ball Z shit and runs at you face first, lightsaber behind her. She also goes at a hilariously slow pace while she does this, so you can just move backwards and shoot her repeatedly in the face, and she can't do anything to stop you? If anything, facing this force user is easier than the other boss battles. You can tank Montross in a minute, but he will shoot back at you and that's something you need to keep dodging. Vosa doesn't do anything long ranged, so this concern goes straight out the window. She doesn't even throw any force powers at you. It's also one of those weird story beats where it reveals the developers only expect Star Wars fans to play this. There's no setup whatsoever for magics and superpowers in this otherwise sci-fi bounty hunting world, and then suddenly BAM! There's a woman here who can leap tall buildings in a single bound and mess with your mind with her mind powers. It's a minor thing, I just find it funny, you know? Like, could you imagine if we were playing a fairly standard third person action game with climbing and shooting, and then suddenly in the third act, supernatural shit started coming out of the goddamn walls? Oh. Either way, your smoke voice from good old Dooku comes in to finish the job. He is here. This story now comes full circle with Open Seasons, in which a young Dooku and Padawan Vosa attacked Django's framed Mandalorian squad on Galadran, and the young warrior took revenge by defeating six Jedi with his bare hands. It's no wonder that Tyrana sought out Django all these years later and concocted a hunt to test his mettle. Django finds out what the real prize is, in Dooku's words, A chance at immortality to pass on your ways to an army crafted in your image. And look, that is an impressive feat for sure, and worth a great deal of money, but Django is more interested in heeding Ross's words. I'll accept your offer, Tyrannus, on one condition. And that is? And so Boba Fett is born, and Django completes his arc. This relatively focused story of one bounty hunter culminates in an essential part of Star Wars history. This deal is the trick shot that creates the clone army and initiates Palpatine's takeover. Django Fett's journey, the hunts that you throw blood, sweat, tears and rockets into, is the journey that changes everything for the entire Skywalker saga. And Django Fett is one of the most thematically important characters in Star Wars. Unlike the empowered and resource-rich Sith Lords, Django is exactly what he says he is. I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe. Like my father before me. And even though it's not quite the immortality that Palpatine and Vader craved, it is immortality from a certain point of view. Tim Timuera Morrison becomes the most prevalent face of the entire Star Wars world. The visage of Django Fett resides in every single beloved clone character, and of course in Boba Fett. Fett. Let's just say they might recognise my face. And he couldn't be further from Palpatine, the man who tried and failed to attain immortality in terms of wealth and status. Palpatine was born on Naboo, has enjoyed a lengthy career as a politician, and has access to all of the knowledge of the Sith. But he could never grow beyond his master's capabilities. His ultimate failure is that he fears death and tries tirelessly to outrun it, but unlike the Jedi, his memory doesn't linger. He is not loved, he is forgotten. That's why it's important that he doesn't come back after Return of the Jedi, in my opinion. Anakin is obsessed with averting death and the end of his loved ones. His drive to save Padme from death ends up destroying his entire life, not to mention the Republic as we know it. His desperate decision making leads him to not only lose Padme, but any chance for a life with Luke and Leia as well. His lust for power ends up corrupting his original intentions. I am more powerful than the Chancellor. I, I can overthrow him. And together, you and I can rule the galaxy. As soon as this happens, the Skywalker family fate is sealed. Django shot immortality is never clouded by power or money, even though it may appear so on the surface. His decision to accept Dooku's offer is a decision that births new life and love. Ross spends the entire game trying to spark something more in Django, a purpose beyond the relentless, unyielding nature of the hunt. Here he asks for an unaltered clone, and when Dooku asks why, Django refuses to answer, 
but we know why. After risking his life and losing Ross, it's about time Django creates some life rather than take it away. It's time he found a new purpose. The bounty hunter turned unexpected father. It's a Mandalorian story as old as time. I think this whole story does a really good job of defining Django and his place amongst the larger pantheon of Star Wars characters. In Attack of the Clones, he's a pretty one-dimensional bad guy, but that doesn't mean he's bad guy. In a galaxy where slavery, mass injustice and corruption exist, what more can the underprivileged classes do but strive to survive? Django is not a villain because he chooses to side with Dooku, he's just trying to live and continue on and create the foundations of a solid life for his son. He's not concerned with separatist politics and he clearly has no time for grand systems in place that allow the corrupt and the wealthy to infest every level of government. <laughs> Django Fett isn't a hero or a villain or a person that enjoys bloodlust and chaos. He's a simple man trying to make his way in the universe. That's not necessarily present in Attack of the Clones, granted, as he is far more moustache twirling when we never get inside his head. Star Wars Bounty Hunter is therefore the essential Django Fett tale and needs to be played if you want to get a definitive experience with the character. Why did we never get a sequel to Star Wars Bounty Hunter? Well. We kind of did in Star Wars 1313. First shown at E3 2013, this game looks to similarly place you in the shoes of a bounty hunter for a shadowy crime saga, but with updated gameplay close to something like Uncharted. Huh. I guess the circle is now complete. We later found out that it was indeed a Boba Fett game and would have given you open world access to Coruscant of all places. Coruscant. I could weep. Former LucasArts developer Celia Hodent took to Twitter recently to talk about the game and reiterated how much the team were excited to show it off to the world and how heartbreaking it was for it to get the can. Now it's eight year old code that will likely never be revisited. But maybe now that the Mandalorian has ushered in a new age for not just the Fets but bounty hunters in general, maybe it's time for the newly established Lucasfilm games to restore the balance to the gaming side of things. With the Book of Boba Fett set to dominate winter 2021, I'm excited to see Fett's moral compass explored further, as well as seeing what Tim Weir and Morrison can bring to the role. Namely a bit of this. <laughs> Star Wars Bounty Hunter proved almost 20 years ago, Jesus, 20 years ago, that Tim Weir and Morrison can carry the lead in a Star Wars project. We might not be getting Star Wars Bounty Hunter 2 or Star Wars 1313, but we're getting the next best thing. And in the interim, why not give this rusty old bucket of bolts game a go? I assure you if you like Star Wars, The Fets and The Mandalorian, you will get some fun and warmth out of this game. It's genuinely well written, tells a rather essential Star Wars tale, and actually has some tense and exhilarating action beats. Just don't expect too much replayability when the action is over. Oh, and cut it some slack for the time it was made. I don't know what it was about this playthrough, but I think I honestly had the most fun I've ever had with this game. I got stressed when the going got tough, but I found myself jumping for joy at the carnage on offer in other moments, and I'm still impressed at how well it weaves into the larger machinations at play during the prequels. I feel like making this video allowed me to really polish off the Star Wars Bounty Hunter experience, and I've gone to really feel every ounce of fun this game has to offer. If you actually want to hear me talk about Attack of the Clones some more, then head on over to your favourite film is awful. This week I'm defending clones from negative reviews alongside your hosts Charlie and Luke. You can also catch me and Charlie on the Full Fat Podcast, where we're not only reviewing every episode of Clone Wars, but WandaVision as well. I've just started making digital art on the Full Fat Videos Instagram. I'm currently a bit of an enthusiastic amateur, but I want to keep getting better and I would love it if you came with me on this little creative journey. I post a lot of Star Wars art, Doctors as Jedi, Keanu Reeves, because of course. The music for this video was once again very kindly provided by Samuel Kim Music, who I'm sure needs no introduction at this point. If you're a Star Wars fan, I don't know how you couldn't have come across Sam's incredible work. If for some strange reason you haven't, head on over to his channel to hear some more awesome Star Wars tracks. Hi guys, Matt here. Thank you for watching another full fat video. Don't forget to click that subscribe button and hit the bell so you know when a new video drops. If you'd like to get in touch with me, why not follow me on Twitter at full fat videos or on Instagram at full underscore fat underscore videos. A big personal thank you to our full fat tier patrons, Dr. Chike, Jax Merrick and Cyrus Solker. Your ongoing support keeps the lights on. Until next time, keep it full fat.